Well, good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Bob coming to you once again here on the Dr. Bob YouTube channel. Um, very excited. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in my welcome back video a few weeks ago to be back with you guys, uh, starting to produce a little bit uh, more content, a little bit more frequently. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the spring was pretty busy as I was getting ready for my board exams, and uh, fortunately all that is done and passed, and I've moved on into the next stage of my career. Um, very excited to be getting back with you guys as we continue our long march through church history. Um, in addition to uh, the series I'm going to be doing in Shaf, or that we're going to be continuing on in Shaf, I'm also going to start uh, going through the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin. Uh, I think that'll be uh, something that will be beneficial to you guys as the audience, particularly those of you who hear the claims of either Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox apologists in regards to uh, the shallowness of Protestantism. Uh, we want to demonstrate that... Uh, we have an apologetic for our faith, and uh, I think that um, even more so than that, uh, the Institutes themselves are uh, one of the masterpieces of uh, Christian writing uh, in all of church history. Um, and Calvin, I would put uh, up there with any theologian in the post-apostolic period. Uh, but with that being said, uh, we are continuing on in Volume 1 of History of the Christian Church, Chapter 3. Uh, this is actually a relatively short chapter, but because of uh, aforementioned life circumstances, uh, it's taken me uh, nearly seven months or eight months, I guess, to get back to it. Um, but uh, we will uh, go ahead and dive in. Um, as I've mentioned before, it's very interesting reading Schaff, uh, considering that he is writing in the 1880s, uh, near the end of the 19th century. Um, he is really our first uh, modern uh, church historian in an exhaustive sense, having covered all the areas of church history. Obviously, there were men before him in the late uh, 18th century and early 19th century, up through the mid-19th century, who had begun the process of the uh, development of what we know as modern uh, church history. Uh, before this uh, time period, uh, the collections of church history that we had uh, were not necessarily scientific or scholarly, um, but were ones that were done on sort of a popular level um, or for people in high-ranking uh, positions. Uh, and so to have um, a church history that was written uh, in an exhaustive fashion uh, to a wide public audience, uh, done in a scholarly and scientific, uh, you know, historical, grammatical um, fashion uh, was just something that uh, was uh, unknown before the beginning of uh, the Enlightenment period, which, yes, there are many problems with the Enlightenment um, and many problems with the scientific revolution, but there are also tremendous benefits. And to ignore uh, the good that came out of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution um, and categorizing it as all bad, I think, is uh, one of the mistakes that people with a more fundamentalist mindset, even though I myself would be classified as a fundamentalist by the left, um, is uh, to our detriment. Um, one of the important things to take away, uh, and this is particularly uh, relevant to chapter 3 of volume 1 that we're discussing today, the Apostolic Age, um, is that uh, Schaff himself is now a part of church history, and the men that he was interacting with, the scholars he was interacting with, um, are also now a part of church history. And it's interesting to peek into not just the time periods that they are writing about, but the time period in which they are writing about church history. Uh, the 19th century, as I've Mentioned before in uh, my book on or my review of the Pope and the Professor, um, 
I believe was one of the uh, most uh, transformative times in human history. Uh, we really see uh, the end of the last vestiges of the medieval period, both in Europe and in the United States in the 19th century, and the rise of the philosophers and theorists uh, and uh, popular uh, figures uh, who influence uh, our culture even to this day uh, for better or often is the case for worse. Uh, men such as Marx and Engels on the political side, Freud on the medical and psychiatric side, um, Charles Darwin with uh, the theory of evolution, um, Friedrich Nietzsche from the philosophical side. All of these men are writing in the 19th century and are contemporaries of Philip Schaff. Uh, in a good sense, the 19th century also gives us men uh, such as Charles Spurgeon, uh, the great Reformed Baptist preacher who was also a contemporary of Schaff. Um, and uh, so we have to uh, recognize uh, the sort of foundational starting point with which Schaff and his contemporaries are writing, that they are really writing at the very beginning of the, I would say, modern and postmodern era, um, when it comes to uh, science, when it comes to uh, historical scholarship, when it comes to archaeology, all of these things have their foundation um, as we know them today in the 19th century, though there were certainly antecedents before then. So with that uh, introduction, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so this is section 20 of volume 1, Sources and Literature of the Apostolic Age. Uh, and as usual, I'll give a few quotes from Schaff, and then uh, we'll uh, commentate on some of those quotes. You know, uh, we'll update the history as necessary, but 80 to 90 percent of the stuff that Schaff presents is still relevant and relatively up-to-date uh, even today. So... Uh, Point one, uh, the sources. Um, uh, Schaff begins talking about the canonical books of the New Testament, and I think this is a perfect place to start uh, in regards to uh, the sources that we have on the history of the apostolic age, which is from the ascension of Christ at Pentecost in 30 AD until the death of the last apostle John around 100 AD. So it's that 70 year time period after uh, the earthly uh, life and ministry of our Lord, his crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and ascension at Pentecost. Um, so uh, at uh, his ascension and then following with Pentecost, uh, that's the beginning of the apostolic age. And uh, that continues on for a couple of generations uh, all the way down to uh, the time of the death of John and uh, the uh, rise of the Nerva Antonine dynasty in secular history with uh, Emperor Trajan. So uh, the uh, canonical books of the New Testament, Schaff has uh, some very good uh, quotes that are still uh, accurate to this day uh, when he states that the 27 books of the New Testament are uh, better supported than any ancient classic, both by a chain of external testimonies, which reaches up to almost the close of the apostolic age, and by the internal evidence of a spiritual depth and unction, which raises them far above the best productions of the second century. And he clearly states, uh, you know, that uh, these 27 books of the New Testament that we have are the most well attested to and supported documents in all of antiquity. Uh, I believe the latest count is somewhere around 5,800 Greek New Testament manuscripts and over 10,000, uh, if not uh, up to 15,000 um, ancient language translations such as Latin and Syriac and Coptic and uh, other uh, languages uh, that existed uh, either in late antiquity or in the early medieval period copying the New Testament. So between the original Greek manuscripts and um, 
the uh, foreign language translations of the Greek um, into those other languages, we have somewhere between 15,000 and 20,000 um, manuscripts of uh, these uh, ancient works, which is far surpasses all of the uh, um, uh, pagan Greek, uh, pagan Greco-Roman literature, uh, ancient Babylonian, ancient Egyptian, uh, other Near Eastern literature, um, Chinese literature, Indian literature, all of it, uh, the New Testament, uh, in terms of the physical material that we have from antiquity, uh, the New Testament is uh, not only second to none, but it's uh, the second place is not even uh, in, in the same ballpark as the attestation of the New Testament. And Schaff comments on how these 27 books uh, give us the chief facts and doctrines of apostolic Christianity, and uh, those facts and doctrines are sufficiently guaranteed even by the minimal canon that uh, even the most liberal of higher critics uh, during Schaff's day and even uh, in our modern day uh, skeptics such as Bart Ehrman would admit. Um, so uh, he talks about uh, the Acts of the Apostles being uh, the uh, description of the external history of primitive Christianity. Um, whereas the epistles give us the internal life and the internal history of that primitive Christianity. He says uh, the Acts and the epistles are independent, contemporaneous, and that's key, contemporaneous with one another and with the events with which they are recording compositions and never refer to each other. And he talks about how Luke probably never read the epistles of Paul, I would probably give a caveat there for Schaff. Uh, I think Luke was possibly instrumental in uh, composing some of the letters of Paul. Uh, and he says, Paul never read the Acts of Luke, although he no doubt supplied much valuable information to Luke. Once again, I think this is conjecture on Schaff's part. But he says, they indirectly illustrate and confirm each other by a number of coincidences which have great evidential value, all the more as these coincidences are undesigned and incidental. And that is key. This is what, uh, this is an important point to emphasize to atheistic or agnostic skeptics, uh, as well as people from other religions like Islam, who would claim uh, that the Bible is somehow corrupted is that we have multiple lines of independent transmission, both of the text as well as the authors themselves. Uh, and because of this multilinearity, there's no one person who is controlling the transmission of God's word in the early period, both in the copying as well as in the original composition. Um, there's not just one apostle or uh, one eyewitness, but there's an entire community of people who are producing these works, sometimes in communication with one another, sometimes and oftentimes not in communication with one another. So we have a lot of independent verification of the chief events, not only of the life of Jesus, but of the history of the apostolic age, as Schaff is talking about. And this is key, uh, not only from an apologetic perspective, but I think is also something that is a source of our confidence in the uh, veracity of the New Testament uh, text. And he says, uh, I think it's good, um, that uh, had Acts and the Epistles been written by post-apostolic writers as some of the more radical skeptics of Schaff's day and many of the those in skeptical scholarship today uh, assert, he said the agreement would have been more complete, uh, and minor disagreements would have been avoided, and lacunae in the acts supplied, especially in regard to the closing labors and the death of Peter and Paul. I think he makes a very good point here that uh, Acts uh, does not comment on what happens to Paul after his imprisonment in Rome. And uh, if the Acts had been written at a later period of time, we would have expected uh, 
that information to be supplied. Um, but this is, I think, good indication. And this is why I love Acts. I'm actually going through the Acts of the Apostles uh, in my personal study right now. Um, it reads uh, in a more riveting fashion than almost any action movie I've ever, ever uh, watched. Um, I've read through Acts multiple times before, but not in this sort of in-depth, inductive way that I am now. Um, and it is um, just a... Uh, uh, you know, heart pounding, um, you know, intense uh, read as you follow the uh, early journeys of uh, the, the apostles and the establishment of the church, and especially as Paul's uh, trip to Rome at the end um, uh, with the shipwreck and uh, landing on Malta, and uh, uh, just a lot of uh, very uh, intense, uh, vivid, um, first hand accounts of uh, history. Um, that we have nothing like in the ancient world. Um, it's just uh, incredible seeing uh, how God's word uh, really is communicating uh, to us facts and events that actually happened in history to see that God is working um, in the world uh, even to this day. Um, so I love that. So uh, Schaff continues on. Uh, and this is, uh, for those who want to follow along uh, in the book, uh, this section started in page 187. I'm currently reading on page 188 on uh, the Acts. Uh, Schaff says, The Acts bear on the face all the marks of an original, fresh, and trustworthy narrative of contemporaneous, there's that word again, contemporaneous events derived from the best sources of information, remember the eyewitnesses, and in great part from personal observation and experience, Luke was involved in the history uh, as he was writing it. Uh, Renan, who is one of the skeptical scholars, he's uh, French, uh, interestingly enough, uh, admirably calls, uh, as Schaff writes, uh, the Acts a book of joy and serene ardor. Since the Homeric poems, no book has been seen full of such fresh sensations, a breeze of morning, an odor of the sea, if I dare express it so, inspiring something joyful and strong, penetrates the whole book and makes it an excellent compagnon de voyage, the exquisite breviary for him who is searching for ancient remains on the seas of the south. This is the second ideal of Christianity, the lake of Tiberias and its fishing banks had furnished the first. Now a more powerful breeze, aspirations toward more distant lands, draws us out into the open sea. And I love that quote, even though it comes from the higher critic, uh, Renan. Uh, Schaff uh, comments um, that uh, Lucan authorship, even amongst skeptics, is almost universally admitted, that it's pretty clear that the writer of Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, and uh, the writer of the Acts of the Apostles is the same individual um, whom tradition uh, and even internal evidence uh, within the New Testament itself all points uh, to the great uh, uh, Greek uh, Dr. Luke uh, writing this two-volume set, uh, the Gospel of Luke being volume one and the Acts of the Apostles being volume two, covering everything from... Uh, the birth of Christ, uh, all the way down uh, to Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. Schaff then moves on to discussing post-apostolic and patristic writings, um, which he says these uh, refer to and are dependent upon the canonical writings. Um, so unlike uh, certain uh, individuals from an imperial church uh, perspective uh, who would see uh, sacred tradition as this sort of uh, equal to uh, the written scriptures in terms of being the voice of God, uh, those post-apostolic writings that comment upon the apostolic period always see themselves in a lesser sense. They're always referring to the canonical books of the New Testament as scripture and never to themselves or to other post-apostolic writing as scripture. They are of a lesser uh, ontological um, authority uh, than the scriptures themselves uh, because they are from a lesser source. The scriptures themselves being God-breathed as opposed to the post-apostolic writings recognized even by their own authors as being of a lesser authority 
and uh, really just uh, commentaries uh, upon the apostolic period themselves. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not important um, and that they don't give us valuable information, but in terms of understanding the faith and the doctrine and how we are to understand primitive Christianity, they are only a lesser and dependent source of information. Um, and I must make this point uh, that I tried to draw out in a recent debate that I saw between an Eastern Orthodox uh, set of apologists arguing or debating a couple of Lutheran apologists. Uh, a question that I asked that was sort of misunderstood uh, that I possibly could have, I think I probably could have referred to it a little better. Um, but I think it's an important point is there is no canonical set of books that you have for quote unquote sacred tradition or the early church fathers. Um, there's no canonical set of passages, uh, even within accepted writers, uh, that are accepted as this is the canon of patristic tradition. Um, that's just an anachronistic concept. And one of the things that modern scholarship in the 19th century, uh, and I will make some, uh, some very interesting comments here about the higher critics, um, that I'd be interested to get, uh, some of your feedback on, um, because I think there actually was a benefit to higher criticism, even with all of the destructive impulse that came with higher criticism, the heresy, the apostasy, the liberalism that came through, which, as I've mentioned before, I believe is the greatest heresy the church has ever faced, um, because it's given birth to communism and Marxism and all of the other problems that we have in our world today. Uh, Neo-Marxism, cultural Marxism, uh, critical race theory, uh, all the other you know, derivatives from there all come back to theological liberalism. Um, that the theological liberals were, in a sense, pushing back against just bad arguments by uh, oftentimes uh, the imperial churches as well as even many of the magisterial uh, reform churches. Uh, in regards to misunderstandings and anachronism that uh, was in their understanding of church history. Uh, so in a way that uh, uh, the um, inability of the imperial churches and uh, many of the magisterial reform churches in dealing uh, with history as it was, as opposed to imposing later views of church government and uh, the nature of the church upon uh, the actual events um, invited uh, the skeptical response from the higher critics. Um, so just because we may disagree with many of the conclusions drawn by the higher critics, I think their impulse is understandable, um, even if uh, not necessarily done from a good perspective. So... Uh, the first two sources, as Schaff uh, has mentioned, just to recap, are the canonical books of the New Testament, and then secondly, the post-apostolic and patristic writings. The third source of information we have on the apostolic period are apocryphal and heretical uh, works of literature. Uh, and he lists out a great many of them. Uh, we've since discovered uh, in the deserts of Egypt the Nag Hammadi Library, which was a Gnostic uh, set of books um, that uh, when, interestingly enough, Irenaeus and his Against Heresies describing Gnosticism, when we compare Irenaeus's description of Gnosticism, which we'll get to in volume two of um, Schaff's work, um, the uh, description of that we see firsthand of Gnosticism in the Nag Hammadi Library is actually quite uh, concordant with uh, Irenaeus's uh, apologetic uh, external critique of Gnosticism, that uh, what the Nag Hammadi Library teaches us about what the Gnostics thought of themselves, uh, Irenaeus actually did a, a fairly good job of describing uh, what Gnosticism was. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, these works that were out there, but not all of the apocryphal works or heretical pieces of literature were directly Gnostic. Um, there were obviously other heresies in the early church as well. Um, uh, Schaff discusses uh, the scholar Lipsius uh, 
dividing the apocryphal uh, acts or the apocryphal literature into four different classes. There's Ebionitic, uh, which that's the Ebionites or the Ebionites. Those are uh, the, essentially the descendants of the Judaizers. Uh, the second category being Gnostic works, as we just talked about. Um, three is originally Catholic, so people like Tertullian, who may have been uh, originally part of the mainstream church, but then later goes off into a heretical group. And then four, Catholic adaptations or recensions of heretical documents. He says, the last class is most numerous, rarely older than the 5th century, and mostly reckon, resting on documents from the 2nd and 3rd centuries. So he mentions uh, some things like the Apocryphal Acts. So these are apoc Apocryphal historical um, works. So things like uh, the Acts of Peter and Paul. And I love that Schaff is actually, you know, using the Latin names of these books. So the Acta Petri et Pauli uh, of Ebionite origin, um, but recast. Uh, the Acts of Paul uh, and Thecliae, uh, mentioned by Tertullian. The Acts of Thomas, the Acts of Matthew, the Acts of Thaddeus, the Martyrium, uh, of Bartholomew, uh, the Acts of Barnabas, uh, the Acts of Andrew, the Acts of Andrew and Matthew, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, the next uh, class, uh, Act, the Apocryphal Epistles. These are correspondence uh, between Paul and Seneca. Uh, the third epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, uh, the Epistle of Mary, the Epistle of Peter and James, or Peter to James, um, there are apocryphal apocalypses, so the Apocalypse of John, which is not the same as Revelation, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apocalypse of Paul. Um, you have all these works uh, that are being written. Um, and then he goes on to quote some of the scholars who've commented. And it's interesting, Tischendorf uh, of Codex Sinaiticus fame was actually one of the scholars who uh, was busy uh, compiling in the earlier part of the 19th century many of these apocryphal works. And then uh, the fourth class of sources that we have um, on the early apostolic period uh, or of the apostolic age are Jewish sources. So Philo and Josephus uh, in particular and Schaff says that Josephus is all important for the history of the Jewish war and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, which marks the complete rupture of the Christian church with the Jewish synagogue and temple. And we'll get to this again, that this is such a monumental event in church history. It confirms Christ as a prophet, that in fact the temple was destroyed uh, within living memory of the people who witnessed Christ and his crucifixion. Just think of the women whom Christ says, don't pray for me uh, or weep for me, but weep for yourselves. Um, and he's clearly alluding to the destruction of the temple um, just 40 years after his crucifixion um, and resurrection. Uh, so um, that has such an important impact on the development of the early church as the early church gets away from its Jewish roots uh, starting in the second century, but really by the third and fourth century um, being a almost exclusively Gentile uh, um, uh, body at that point. Uh, so obviously Josephus is so important. Uh, he also mentions uh, the early Talmudic literature that rises out of the Pharisees, particularly in the aftermath of the Jewish-Roman Wars. Um, and uh, he talks about a number of uh, historians, including uh, J.B. Lightfoot, uh, the great Anglican, uh, compiling these works. Um, and then uh, finally, the fifth uh, source of information that we have on the apostolic age uh, are the heathen writers. So these are pagan uh, Greco-Roman writers, Tacitus, uh, Pliny, Suetonius, uh, Lucian, uh, Celsus, uh, Porphyry, and Julian the Apostate uh, being heathen writers. And uh, he comments this on um, these, that these are the least uh, useful for the most part, except in a couple of instances, um, in that uh, these heathen writers uh, furnish only fragmentary, mostly incidental, distorted, and hostile information, but it's of apologetic value considering how was the early uh, Gentile, pagan, Greco-Roman world responding to the growth of Christianity. So uh, section two of uh, section 
or subsection two of section 20 of chapter three. Uh, Schaff then begins to talk about various histories of the apostolic age uh, that have been written uh, both in modern times as well as ancient. Um, he discusses a number of English writers um, uh, as well as, uh, it's interesting, uh, he comments on his own uh, teacher, once again, Augustus Neander, um, uh, which uh, Schaff considers uh, to himself be the first, you know, uh, sort of epic defining work in church history uh, in the modern age was by his uh, teacher, Augustus Neander, who um, I hope to read some Neander in the future. Um, as you guys know from my video, finding out of my Jewish heritage and knowing that Neander was a, a Jewish convert to uh, Lutheranism and was a uh, devout um, uh, Protestant with an evangelical spirit. Uh, I have much personal affection for uh, someone like Neander uh, from a, a similar background. Uh, and Schaff clearly, uh, uh, even in just writing in footnotes, um, has uh, much affection for his old his old teacher. Um, there's a number of other uh, people. It's interesting, Schaff mentions himself again in the third person on page 190, talking about his earlier work, uh, The History of the Apostolic Church. Um, then he gets into uh, skeptical writers, uh, people like Heinrich Ewald um, from uh, Göttingen, uh, one of the um, uh, higher critics, but uh, who was neither part of the Tübingen school nor... Uh, the traditional Orthodox school, uh, Evald is certainly an interesting writer in his own uh, his own right uh, own works. Uh, who tries to, um, you know, sort of go his own way and is criticized by both uh, Bauer's disciples in Tübingen as well as uh, traditional uh, Orthodox writers like Schaff. Uh, we see uh, Ernest Renan, uh, our great uh, French higher critic, uh, who actually found himself on the Index of Prohibited Books uh, by the Pope, uh, wrote a lot of works and just Schaff commenting on uh, the French Renan. Um, he says that uh, Renan's works on the Apostolic Age are obviously the work of a skeptical outsider, but uh, Renan has a brilliant genius, eloquence, and secular learning. He says, uh, as Renan, who I believe was contemporary, um, continued to write, uh, his scholarly value uh, increased as Renan advanced. Um, he talks about Renan's The Life of Jesus. Uh, this is the book that got Renan uh, on the bad side of the Pope. Uh, and I would agree with the Pope in regards to uh, the questionable uh, character of this particular work. Um, Schaff says that the, the life of Jesus, uh, Renan's uh, work, is most interesting and popular, but also by far the most objectionable volume because it deals almost profanely with the most sacred theme. Yes, Renan was an atheist. Uh, he talks about um, supernatural religion, which is a, apparently was an important work in Schaff's day. It was an anonymous work. Uh, that was an English reproduction and repository of the critical speculations of the Tübingen School of Bauer, Strauss, uh, Zeller, Schweigler, uh, Hilgenfeld, and uh, Volkmar, uh, among others. He says the first volume is mostly taken up with a philosophical discussion with the question of miracles. Uh, volume 1 and Volume 2, or the remainder of Volume 1 and then Volume 2, contain a historical inquiry into the apostolic origin of the canonical Gospels uh, with, as the higher critics typically were a negative result, so the higher critics don't believe that the canonical Gospels were written by the Apostles. Uh, then volume three of this work discusses Acts, the Epistles, the Apocalypse, that's the Revelation, um, the evidence for the Resurrection and Ascension, which are resolved into hallucinations or myths. So once again, when you see your garden variety skeptical atheist, uh, you know, saying that, oh, this is like, you know, the swoon theory or Paul was hallucinating or the disciples were hallucinating. This is all coming from 19th century German higher criticism. Like that's where 
all of this craziness comes from. Um, but it's important that we document uh, where uh, these bad ideas come from. So uh, Schaff then continues uh, regarding supernatural religion, that starting with the affirmation of the antecedent incredibility of miracles, once again, this is presuppositional apologetics right here, this work in the Tübingen School, the higher critics, those following in Schleiermacher and Bauer's steps, their primary presupposition is that they're not supernaturalists. They don't believe in God, so of course they're not going to believe in miracles. Not in a supernatural sense. Um, so they start by denying these presuppositions, and then by denying the presuppositions that we as believing Christians operate with, that the New Testament is historical and faithful, and describes the actual life of Jesus, who is the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Son of God, uh, who was incarnate for us and for our salvation, and then going on from there, the life of his apostles in the early church. They deny all of this. They deny that Jesus was who he said he was. So, of course, they're going to arrive at this, you know, skeptical conclusion. Um, doesn't mean that they're correct. Uh, this is what James White has often talked about in his dividing line, about demythologizing scholarship. It's something that we have to do. So, uh, yes, uh, so... Uh, starting with the incredibility of miracles, the author arrives at the conclusion of their impossibility. And the philosophical conclusion determines the historical investigation throughout. Once again, it's important to be scholarly. It's important uh, to be scientific. Um, but even then, we have to recognize people's presuppositions. There is no neutral party. Everybody has a bias when they're coming in. We have to recognize our biases. Um, we have to account for those biases, um, especially as we're dealing with uh, historical matters so that we are not reading our own interpretation. Um, not everybody was a Reformed Baptist or a Presbyterian, nor were they Roman Catholic nor Eastern Orthodox. In the early church, um, we have to take the history as it is, um, but recognize our biases uh, when we encounter uh, certain subjects. And so Schaff then continues on um, discussing supernatural religion. Uh, Dr. Schur in the theological uh, Literzeitung uh, for 1879, volume number 36, page 60. Uh, 622 denies to this work scientific value for Germany, but gives it credit for extraordinary familiarity with recent German literature and great industry in collecting historical details. Remember, the 19th century Germans loved history, uh, along with chemistry. Those were their two uh, strong points. He then continues, Doctors Lightfoot, Sande, Ezra Abbott, and others have exposed the defects of its scholarship and the false premises from which the writer reasons. So here is the orthodox pushback. Uh, J.B. Lightfoot, of course, being the great uh, orthodox Anglican uh, writer, theologian, and historian, uh, is pushing back against the German higher critics, showing like, look, you guys aren't just, you know, reproducing uh, the bare history. You're bringing your agenda. And so we're going to push back against your skeptical agenda. So it's good to see that there were even men uh, in that uh, skeptical age who were pushing back against the higher critics. Uh, Schaff sadly comments that the rapid sale of supernatural religion indicates the extensive spread of skepticism and the necessity of fighting over, again, on Anglo-American ground, the theological battles of Germany and Holland, it is hoped to be with more triumphant success. And that last line there is one I take with uh, sort of bittersweetness because Anglo-American scholarship did hold out against theological liberalism longer than German or Dutch or continental uh, Protestant scholarship did. Um, but uh, alas, um, we have seen a collapse, uh, especially... Um, in the post-Cold War period, um, really in the post-World War II period generally, but especially since the 1960s, um, 
the uh, bitter um, uh, collapse of believing mainstream Anglo-American uh, Christian scholarship, uh, conservative scholarship uh, since the 1960s and 70s really has been marginalized uh, even within the English-speaking world. Um, but now uh, the church continues to grow and spread, and we see it spreading in Africa and Latin America and East Asia and scholars from those areas arising. And so perhaps uh, uh, as I am recording this, you know, and we will see uh, great works uh, coming from uh, believing evangelical Christians in the global south uh, and from scholars from that persuasion uh, in the coming generations. Uh, we can only pray and hope for that. Schaff also obviously comment, comments on uh, the aforementioned uh, J.B. Lightfoot, who is the Bishop of Durham uh, in Schaff's day. Uh, he says that Lightfoot had written a series of elaborate articles against supernatural religion in the journal Contemporary Review uh, between 1875 and 1877. Uh, Schaff says they should be republished in book form. Um, and he uh, compares uh, also the reply of the anonymous author and the lengthy preface to the sixth edition. He said, Lightfoot's commentaries on Paul, the Pauline epistles contain valuable excursuses on several historical questions of the apostolic age, especially since St. Paul in the three, uh, in the communication or commentary on Galatians, page 283 through 355. Uh, and I believe Lightfoot ended up i would have to go back and check that. If any of you guys know in the comments uh, any good Lightfoot resources, I believe many of these works that uh, Lightfoot had in letter form were, in fact, re-edited and published in book form. Um, and then Schaff continues on talking about a number of other uh, scholars. Um, but for brevity's sake, uh, to keep things moving, we will end the discussion of the subsection 2, uh, Histories of the Apostolic Age, and move on to subsection 3, of section 20, the chronology of the apostolic age, and he gives all of his sources up front as usual. And uh, he uh, uh, then moves on to section 21, talking about uh, the general character of the apostolic age. Uh, and there's a little uh, German quote by uh, an author named uh, Follock uh, at the beginning of page 194, if you guys want to read that. Uh, I can't understand it, but it looks interesting. Um, uh, Schaff discusses the extent and the environment of the apostolic age. Um, I'll read uh, just a few lines from him. He says, The apostolic period extends from the day of Pentecost to the death of St. John and covers about 70 years from AD 30 to 100. The field of action is Palestine and gradually extends over Syria, Asia Minor, Greece, and Italy. The most prominent centers are Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome, which represent, respectively, the mother churches of Jew Jewish, Gentile, and United Catholic Christianity. <clears throat> Not sure about that last interpolation, but uh, it's interesting. He then continues, uh, next to them are Ephesus and Corinth. Ephesus acquired a special importance by the residence and labors of John, which made themselves felt during the second century through Polycarp and Irenaeus. Samaria, Damascus, Joppa, Caesarea, Tyre, uh, Cyprus, the provinces of Asia Minor, Troas, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Crete, Patmos, Malta, Pudioli, come also into view as points where the Christian faith was planted. Through the eunuch converted by Philip, it reached Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. As early as AD 58, Paul could say, from Jerusalem, round about even into Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. He afterwards carried it to Rome, where it had already been known before, and possibly as far as Spain, the western boundary of the empire. Uh, discussing uh, Romans uh, 15, 24, and comparing that to uh, Clement of Rome and his epistle um, to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 5. Uh, the uh, Clementine comment, uh, epito uh, terma teis uh, uh, dusuos uh, elkzon, basically like to the end of the world or to the end of the, the earth. Um, 
Uh, Schaff does comment, though, that uh, Clement's passage doesn't necessarily mean Spain, um, and Paul's journey to Spain stands or falls with the hypothesis of his second Roman captivity. Uh, we can get into that later. Uh, Schaff then says, the nationalities reached by the gospel in the first century were the Jews, the Greeks, and the Romans. The languages used were Hebrew or Aramaic, and especially Greek, which was at that time the organ of civilization and of internal, international intercourse within the Roman Empire. Contemporary secular history includes the reigns of the Roman emperors from Tiberius to Nero and Domitian, who either ignored or persecuted Christianity. We are brought directly into contact with King Herod Agrippa I, grandson of Herod the Great, the murderer of the apostle James the Elder, and with his son, King Agrippa II, the last of the Herodian house, who with his sister Bernice, or we would call her Bernice, a most corrupt woman, listened to Paul's defense with two Roman governors, uh, Felix and Festus, that is Antonius Felix and Porcius or Porcius Festus, uh, from the Roman histories, with Pharisees and Sadducees, with Stoics and Epicureans, with the temple and theater at Ephesus, with the court of uh, the Areopagus, that's Mars Hill at Athens, and with Caesar's palace in Rome. Beautiful description. Um, beautiful description by Schaff. He then talks about the sources of information that we have. Um, he says, the author of Acts records the heroic march of Christianity from the capital of Judaism to the capital of heathenism with the same artless simplicity and serene faith as the evangelists tell the story of Jesus, well knowing that it needs no embellishment, no apology, no subjective reflections, and that it will surely triumph by its inherent spiritual power. Here's Schaff's admirable postmillennialism coming into view. So um, he says, the Acts and the Pauline epistles accompany us with reliable information down to the year 63. And uh, that history is then lost out of sight in the shadow of the fires of the Neronian persecution, which is uh, the great fire which broke out in Rome in 64. Uh, most people suspected that it was the emperor Nero himself who had set the fire. Um, and so the population is getting angry, so Nero needs to deflect from this. And so he blames the Christians and uh, the horrific uh, details of the Neronian persecution will be uh, reserved for now, but uh, needless to say, um, uh, was the first great persecution of Christians uh, in the history of the church. And uh, uh, that is, uh, interestingly enough, portrayed in one of my favorite Hollywood movies, Quo Vadis, starring Peter... Sir Peter Ustinov as the mad Emperor Nero, who really carries the, the movie. Um, it follows, uh, you know, um, historical fiction work. Um, I believe it was Henry Sinkowitz who wrote that book, which was then adapted into a Hollywood film in the 1950s uh, before Ben-Hur. Um, it was really the original Sword and Sandals, but it uh, details a very interesting take on uh, the last days of the Emperor Nero, um, before he's overthrown and his persecution of Christians. Um, it's a great movie. Check out Quo Vadis, uh, uh, with, uh, uh by Henry Sinkowitz, uh, both the book and the movie. Uh, so anyways, uh, Schaff uh, briefly comments on uh, how the history of Acts is uh, stopped short uh, before the great persecution uh, by Nero. And he says the last 30 years of the period, um, and this is post-Flavian destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, that's the Flavian dynasty, uh, Vespasian, who uh, won uh, the Roman Civil War known as the Year of the Four Emperors, which I find one of the more fascinating histories, um, one of the more fascinating periods in Roman history. Um, briefly, uh, after Nero is uh, declared an enemy of the state by the Senate and uh, goes out to one of his villas. Uh, Nero commits suicide, thus ending, I believe, 117 years of rule by Julius Caesar's family. Remember, Nero was a descendant and a relative of Julius Caesar. Um, 
maybe not a direct descendant, but uh, a descendant of Caesar Augustus, who is the grand nephew of Julius Caesar. So from that same Julio um, and then later Claudian uh, family, so the Julio-Claudian dynasty, which had ruled Rome ever since Caesar, Julius Caesar had been declared dictator um, 117 years prior, um, that... Uh, for first time in 117 years, there was not uh, a Caesar, a Julian, uh, or a Julio-Claudian on the throne. And so there was a scramble for power. Uh, governor Galva from Spain, who was a senior governor, uh, took over. And a lot of people thought he would be good, but he was an old man. Or because he was an old man and a very traditional Roman in certain ways. But Galva actually turned out to be a pretty poor emperor, um, even though he toppled Nero. Um, he was uh, vicious and uh, corrupt uh, in a way that the Roman people were not expecting. He played favorites and uh, was a miser in terms of finances, didn't indulge the bread and circuses of the people and didn't pay the army. And so that lost him both support in the provinces where Governor Vitellius in uh, Germany revolted uh, but at the same time, uh, Otho, who was a companion of Nero and a close personal friend of Nero, but who had supported Galba because Nero had actually slept uh, with Otho's wife and uh, then took her, took her as his own wife, uh, forcing Otho to divorce her. Um, Otho uh, actually deposes Galba in Rome, has him assassinated, is declared emperor, but uh, within three months he's having to march north to meet Vitellius's armies coming out of Germany, and uh, he is defeated by Vitellius. Vitellius takes the throne, um, but in the east where Vespasian uh, and his son Titus were waging war against the Jews in the first great Roman war, um, Vespasian who had acknowledged Galba as the proper successor to Nero after Galba's assassination, Titus returns to him, um, and uh, he and Titus then make a, a, a declaration for the throne. And so um, what ends up happening is that uh, governors loyal to Vespasian in the eastern part of the empire declare Vespasian counter-emperor to Vitellius. Vitellius was a fat man. He was a glutton. Um, he was uh, not fit uh, to be emperor in his personal uh, life. He was just uh, a sp wantonly spent the treasury in opposition to what Galba had done. It was the exact opposite problem. Uh, like I said, he was just a huge man in terms of belly and girth and uh, just, you know, morbidly obese. And uh, while he had some inclinations to be a good prince uh, as a heard the histories described by uh, his uh, vices uh, overshadowed his better character. And so Vitellius ended up uh, losing uh, the last bit of the civil war known as the year of the four emperors to Vespasian, uh, which Vespasian's name was Titus uh, uh, Flavius uh, Vespasianus, which is where we get the term Flavian since Flavius was Vespasian's family name. So the Flavian dynasty, which had no connection to the prior Julio-Claudian dynasty, emerges from the ashes of the year of the four emperors. And uh, Vespasian takes the throne, and then his sons Titus and then Domitian rule uh, successively uh, in his stead for a period of about 30 years um, before Domitian is assassinated. Um, so, uh, yes, that's... Uh, the period of time that is the Flavian dynasty from 70 AD to 96 AD uh, is a dark period in the apostolic age. Um, we know that John is probably still alive at this point. Um, so there is there are people who saw Jesus, the risen Christ, within living memory, uh, with their own eyes still living in those last 30 years of uh, the first century, but uh, with the passing away of John and the close of the first century, uh, that signals the end of the apostolic age and the beginning uh, 
of the uh, anti-Nicene patristic era. So um, it's interesting that uh, the DDK had only recently been discovered in Schaff's day. And so the DDK, Clement's epistle to the Corinthians, possibly Mathetes to Diognetus, um, and maybe one or two other works come from those last 30 years, uh, contemporaneous with the writings of the last canonical books, which are John's Gospel, John's Epistle, and then, depending on the controversy and what side you take, uh, the Revelation. Um, but uh, we actually, those last 30 years, don't know a whole lot about what uh, uh, happened. So Schaff comments... Uh, in his last paragraph of this section, the remaining 30 years of the first century are involved in mysterious darkness illuminated only by the writings of John, as we mentioned. This is a period of church history about which we know least and would like to know most. This period is the favorite field for ecclesiastical fables and critical conjectures. How thankfully would the historian hail the discovery of any new authentic documents between the martyrdom of Peter and Paul and the death of John and again, between the death of John and the age of Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, um, agreed uh, so much with that. Um, so much of the battlefield for uh, Christendom and the many uh, different uh, denominations and expressions of the faith, uh, the different communions, the imperial churches, magisterial reformer churches, uh, low church Protestant churches, um, that uh, we all contest, well, what happened between uh, John and, uh, or the death of uh, Peter and Paul and the death of John. We just don't know a lot. Um, John doesn't comment a whole lot about the structure of the church outside of uh, the second and third chapters of Revelation uh, and a couple of allusions here and there in uh, his three epistles. We don't know about bishops and deacons and apostolic session. None of that stuff is mentioned. So we just don't know. Um, and again, uh, there's a lot of, uh, as he mentioned, both from skeptical scholars, uh, critics, as well as uh, pious uh, myths uh, are, um, many of them have their uh, soil and their uh, seed in the last 30 years of the first century um, in the latter part of the apostolic age. Um, so continuing on, uh, Schaff then, uh, goes on to a new subsection called The Causes of Success, talking about why was the Christian church successful. Um, and he says this, uh, As to the numerical strength of Christianity at the close of the first century, we have no information whatever. Statistical reports were unknown in those days. The estimate of half a million among the 100 millions or more inhabitants of the Roman Empire is probably exaggerated. And even Schaff's numbers there are probably a little exaggerated. It was probably somewhere between 50 and 90 million people. Uh, who lived within the Roman Empire at that point. Um, once again, I'm going to update with modern numbers whenever we come to these discrepancies. Um, Schaff talks about uh, where some of the sources and numbers come from. Uh, he says they're scanty and fragmentary. Um, Acts 2.41 talks about 3,000 souls being added in one day. Uh, Tacitus and his annals... Um, I'm using the Latin pronunciation. Some of you call it Tacitus, but I prefer proper Latin, uh, Tacitus. Uh, in uh, Book 15, Chapter 44, uh, talks about the immense multitude martyred by Nero. Uh, and Schaff says, in any case, Christianity uh, was a small minority faith in the apostolic age. And we know this, probably no more than 5 to 10% at most, and probably only about 1 or 2%. Uh, of the entire population, if that, um, in the apostolic age. We really don't get up to about 10% until we get into the 3rd century, um, according to most scholars. Um, he says that uh, the Christian converts belong mostly to the middle and lower classes of society. Fishermen, peasants, mechanics, traders, freedmen, slaves. And he quotes Paul's... Uh, you know, great line from 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 26 to 29, uh, not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. That's eugenos uh, in the Greek, uh, literally eugenic, uh, where we get our term eugenic, not many with good genes uh, or good birth. 
um, which these are words that had so much meaning in the day in which they were written and the very stratified society that was the Roman Empire. Um, uh, he continues on quoting Paul, but God chose the foolish things of the world that he might put to shame them that are wise, and God chose the weak things of the world that he might put to shame the things that are strong and the base things of the world and the things that are despised. God did choose, yea, and the things that are not, that he might bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory before God. Schaff then says, And yet these poor, illiterate churches were the recipients of the noblest gifts and alive to the deepest problems and highest thoughts which can challenge the attention of an immortal mind. Christianity built from the foundation upward. We always have to remember that. Our faith has its roots as a persecuted, underground, minority religion despised both by the heathen world and by the pretensions of the Jewish elite in its day. That Christianity really is a religion of the common person, the average person, the lower and middle classes of society. Um, not kings and generals and great musicians or actors or all of the people that you think of in our society today, but it's the common average salt of the earth. Um, I've heard one commentator call them dirt people. Um, that this is the foundation and soil um, that God came to the despised of the world, the lowly of the world, um, the non-influential in the world, um, those whom society would look down upon, um, these were the people that God used to build his church. And uh, it's only later in church history, after the Constantinian uh, reforms and revolution, uh, where sacralism starts to come in. But in the first three centuries, Christianity was not a sacral religion. Um, it was not a state religion. Um, and I believe that is directly related um, to how God used uh, the church to grow the church. That it was not dependent on the organs of the state. This is in direct contrast to Islam, that while Muhammad and, uh, you know, the very beginnings of his alleged, and I stress the word alleged, prophethood, um, he is a persecuted minority prophet in Mecca and then goes to Medina, but uh, as soon as he takes over in Medina, he starts preaching war and conquest. And um, by 632, um, uh, Islam is a state religion and uses the organ of the state uh, to spread. Um, it's not primarily through merchants or traders uh, in contrast to um, um, many uh, libtard... Western historians who fawn over Islam, not knowing the actual history of Islam. But anyways, that's beside the point. Um, Shah says, at the time of the conversion of Constantine, beginning in the 4th century, the number of Christians may have reached 10 or 12 millions. He said about one-tenth of the total population of the empire. Once again, I think it's an overestimation of the population of the Roman Empire. It's probably between 50 and 90 million people, so maybe about Two to five million people are Christians by the time of Constantine's uh, conversion. Um, Schaff says the rapid success of Christianity under the most unfavorable circumstances is surprising and its own best vindication. It was achieved in the face of an indifferent or hostile world and by its purely spiritual and mortal means without shedding a drop of blood except that of its own innocent martyrs. Gibbon, in the famous 15th chapter of his history, and he's talking about Edward Gibbon uh, in his uh, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, um, attributes the rapid spread to five causes, namely the intolerant but largely religious zeal of the Christians inherited from the Jews, two, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul concerning which the ancient philosophers had but vague and dreamy ideas, three, the miraculous powers attributed to the primitive church, number four, the superior 
and pure uh, but austere morality of the first Christians, and five, the unity and discipline of the church, which gradually formed a growing commonwealth in the heart of the empire. But I love what Schaff says, pushing against Gibbon's purely naturalistic interpretation. But every one of these causes, properly understood, points to the superior excellency and to the divine origin of the Christian religion. And this is the chief cause which the deistic historian omits. Amen, Dr. Schaff. Moving on then, Schaff uh, talks about the significance of the apostolic age. He says, this is the age of the Holy Spirit, inspiration and legislation for all subsequent ages. He says, here springs in its fresh original, or original freshness and purity, the living water of the new creation. Christianity comes down from heaven as a supernatural fact, yet long predicted and prepared for and adapted to the deepest wants of uh, human nature. He says, signs and wonders and extraordinary demonstrations of the Spirit for the conversion of unbelieving Jews and heathens, attend its entrance into the world of sin. It takes up its permanent abode within our fallen race to transform it gradually without war or bloodshed by a quiet, leaven-like process into a kingdom of truth and righteousness. Modest and humble, lowly and unseemly in outward appearance, but steadily conscious of its divine origin and its eternal destiny without silver or gold, but rich in supernatural gifts, powers, strong in faith, fervent in love, and joyful in hope, bearing in earthen vessels the imperishable treasures of heaven. It presents itself upon the age of history as the only true, the perfect religion for all the nations of the earth. And he uh, uh, talks about, uh, continuing on, in virtue of this original purity, vigor, and beauty, and the permanent success of permanent Christianity, the canonical authority of the single but inexhaustible volume of its literature, and the character of the apostles, those inspired organs of the Holy Spirit, untaught teachers of mankind, the apostolic age has incomparable interests and importance in the history of the church. It is the immovable groundwork of the whole. It has the same regulative force for all the subsequent developments of church history as the inspired writings of the apostles have for the works of all later Christian authors. So once again, this is where the battleground comes in among the various uh, uh, self-identified Christian confessions and communions uh, where we come to our differences is how do we interpret the apostolic age? How do we interpret the writings that come from the apostolic age, the Pauline and Catholic epistles uh, primarily, uh, as well as the Acts of the Apostles? Um, these are the battleground for well, what is the church? And so um, that is the significance of this particular period in church history. It's the most important period in church history because it's the first period of church history. Um, he says, uh, finally, in his last paragraph of uh, the significance of the apostolic age, furthermore, the apostolic Christianity is preformative and contains the living gems of all the following periods, personages, and tendencies. It holds up the highest standard of doctrine and discipline. It is the inspiring genius of all true progress. It suggests to every age its peculiar problem with the power to resolve it. Christianity can never outgrow Christ, but it grows in Christ. Theology cannot go beyond the Word of God, but it must ever progress in the understanding and application of the Word of God. The three leading apostles represent not only the three stages of the apostolic church, but also as many ages and types of Christianity, and yet they are all present in every age and every type. Um... <laughs> Once again, this is typological language, uh, romantic language that Schaff is using. Uh, one of my favorite YouTube personalities, Reverend Donald Veach, uh, down uh, southeast of me in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, an amazing, uh, reformed, believing Episcopal reverend, no longer part of the Episcopal Church. He's now part of a more conservative Anglican denomination. Um, he uh, loves to call Schaff the romantic. And uh, what I really see is that this is Schaff's, you know, Presbyterian uh, post-millennialism coming out, uh, that uh, 
hey, it has an appeal. Christ will conquer. He is coming. He is overcoming the world. And um, it's not the, um, with all due respect to my dispensational friends, the sort of cataclysmic end of the world, uh, you know, but that Christ is coming and that uh, he is overcoming the world gradually, even now. Um, I know my dispensationalist friends wouldn't deny that, but uh, certainly a difference in how that works out. Um, so yes, uh, Schaff then moves on to talking about the representative apostles. He discusses Peter, Paul, and John being the primary three, and how they correspond in Schaff's uh, typological uh, you know, mind uh, to the centers of influence of Jerusalem, Antioch, and Rome. He said, Our Lord himself had chosen three out of the twelve for his most intimate companions, who alone witnessed the transfiguration and the agony in Gethsemane. They fulfilled all the expectations, Peter and John by their long and successful labors, James the Elder by drinking early the bitter cup of his master as the proto-martyr of the twelve. Um, since his death in 8044, James the brother of the Lord, once again, is important apologetic against the imperial churches and the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary, seems to have succeeded him as one of the three pillars of the church of the circumcision, that's the church of the Jews, Although he did not belong to the apostles in the strict sense of the term, and his influence as the head of the Church of Jerusalem was more local than ecumenical. Once again, the idea of viewing the Council of Jerusalem as some sort of proto-ecumenical council um, or some sort of canonical council in the sense of the canonical structures that would arise later is thoroughly anachronistic. Um, and uh, I don't think the... Not I don't think... The men at that council would have had no idea um, of what an ecumenical council was, um, that it would have some sort of authority on the level of scripture. Um, really what you see at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 is the um, Jewish leaders of the church in Jerusalem, um, James being the leader, not Peter, that's of significance for our uh, papist friends, um, that uh, it's an application of the Old Testament scriptures. You have Gentiles coming into the faith, uh, having been converted by the labors of Paul and Barnabas. Um, and so the church in Jerusalem is really just advising um, the apostles with a few set rules being laid down. Um, how do we apply the Old Testament law? Um, to these new uh, Jews or these new Gentiles who are coming into the faith. And what we have to remember, especially, is that this is before the destruction of the temple. Um, so the Judaism of the Jerusalem church would have been very strong. And when I mean Judaism, I'm talking about Second Temple Judaism. I'm not talking about uh, later rabbinical Judaism. Um, so uh, that's really what the Council of Jerusalem was about. It was a local gathering of the leading men of the church along with the rest of the brethren trying to how best do we deal with these Gentiles who are coming in. There's no canonical rules. There's no confession of faith um, that's written. It's And while later councils will use Acts 15 and the quote-unquote Council of Jerusalem as a model, um, once again, it's not a council in the same sense that we see later church councils. But I will say it does provide a model for how uh, um, church should be done um, within the local context. And it did provide a model in history um, for those nascent councils uh, prior to the greater councils that come centuries later. Schaff... Um, talks about uh, how James's uh, influence uh, in particular, once again, just wrapping this up, uh, seems to have been local rather than ecumenical, um, as he mentions. So then uh, he talks about uh, for nine of the 12 apostles beyond Peter, James, and John, we have really very little information outside of Philip in Acts chapter 8 uh, regarding their labors. There's a lot of stories and traditions and church history about the various apostles and where they went, uh, Thomas to India, 
uh, Bartholomew uh, to various places, um, but no real concrete facts. And many of these traditions are definitely of later origin and outside of what people may have been thinking in the fourth or fifth century about the early church, they don't really give us much in the way of primary source information. He talks about Paul uh, being <clears throat> the last apostle and called out of regular order by the personal appearance of the exalted Lord from heaven. Um, but he says he was in authority and importance equal to any of the three pillars, but filled a place of his own as the independent apostle of the Gentiles. What I find is interesting. After Christ's ascension in uh, before Pentecost, outside of the Apostle John and the Revelation, there's only one person who sees the risen Christ or who has seen the risen Christ physically, bodily, attesting to his resurrection in an independent fashion um, ever since that day until now. And that is the Apostle Paul at the Damascus Road. I think we have to emphasize that. Paul saw the physical, risen body of the Lord appear to him. Jesus himself came to Paul in a special way. Um, it doesn't mean Paul is above the other apostles, but uh, we have to recognize Paul himself was an eyewitness of the resurrection. And that's so important to push back against skeptical, atheistic, and agnostic uh, scholarship. Um, that what the Acts of the Apostles and what Paul himself claims in his own writings is that he saw the risen Christ. And that was the basis of his apostolic ministry, was the personal call of Jesus. And the other apostles recognized it. Um, so... Uh, it's important to mention that to push back against skeptical scholarship on one point, but it's also important to push back against heretics and Gnostics and um, various cult groups that claim to have seen Jesus. Paul was the last one <laughs> to have seen Jesus um, who had not seen him before uh, his resurrection, he saw him, or before his crucifixion. Uh, Paul saw Jesus. Now, John, of course, saw Jesus as well, um, again, uh, post-ascension. Um, but John had lived with Jesus and had seen Jesus uh, before the ascension as well. Um, so it was really a reappearing of Jesus uh, to John, whereas Paul saw the risen Christ um, potentially for the first time. He may have been there uh, and seen Jesus' trial, um, but at least as a believing person, um, being converted by seeing the risen Christ. Paul is the only one post-ascension. Um, so I think that's very important and conspicuous to point out. Um, Schaff then continues on talking about the labors of the apostles. He talks about James and Peter. He says, we can follow in the Acts to the Council of Jerusalem in about AD 50 uh, and a little beyond. Uh, and he says, we can follow Paul's labors to his first imprisonment in Rome uh, between the years 61 and 63 AD. And then he said, John lived to the close of the first century. And I believe that because I believe John was the youngest of the apostles, or at least one of the youngest of the apostles. And may have only been a preteen or a young teenager during Jesus' life. So it's like, well, how can somebody who was walking with Jesus in 30 AD live all the way to 100? It's like if John is only 10, 12, 13 years old, during the events of the Gospels, um, I've heard some say as young as seven, um, it would make sense um, how John uh, could live from 30 to 70, about 80 years old, which is an old man, uh, but not beyond the realm of possibility. It's not like we're talking about a 100 year old even though in rare cases people did live to be 100. Um, John certainly could have made that age, um, and especially with God's providential care. Um, but anyways, continuing on, uh, he says, uh, 
uh, Schaff continues, as to their labors, we have no authentic information in the New Testament um, beyond what was written, um, but the unanimous testimony of antiquity was that Peter and Paul suffered martyrdom in Rome during or after the Neronian persecution, and that John died a natural death at Ephesus. The Acts breaks off abruptly with Paul still living and working a prisoner in Rome, quote, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and unforbidding him. A significant conclusion, indeed. Um, Schaff uh, then gives a brief character sketch of Peter and Paul and John. He describes Peter as headstrong, unlearned, and the rock apostle, a man of action, and the chief of the twelve. He says Paul is the champion of freedom and progress. Uh, he was bold and noble, uh, but also uncompromising. And John was a man of uh, intense contemplation, whose writings are serene, profound, sublime, and inexhaustible. Um, he describes their relationships among one another. Uh, he says Paul met Peter about 40 AD. Um, and we see this in Acts. He says Paul met the rest of the pillar apostles around 50 AD at the Council of Jerusalem. A short time later, Paul comes into conflict with Peter in Antioch over the Judaizers, which we see in Galatians. Paul refers to Peter for the last time around 57 AD in 1 Corinthians 9.5. Um, Peter mentions Paul in 2 Peter, confirming him as a fellow apostle in the churches who are ministered to by Paul uh, in their faith. Uh, and he talks about how Paul's writings are hard to understand sometimes, but uh, deeply profound. Um, uh, according to tradition, both Peter and Paul were martyred under Nero in Rome. Uh, Paul on the Ostian Road at Trefontaine, uh, that's the three fountains. But it's literally a well with three heads. Um, Peter was uh, allegedly crucified upside down on the Janiculum Hill, which is one of the seven hills of the city of Rome. Uh, Schaff describes Peter as the primary actor of the first stage of Christianity. He was a poor fisherman of Galilee who had neither gold nor silver and was crucified as a malefactor and a slave. Um, and uh, there's a quote here uh, at the end. Um, uh, yes, uh, Schaff, uh, quoting Peter, uh, says that uh, he fulfilled the prophecy of his name in laying the foundation of the church among the Jews and the Gentiles. In the second stage, he is overshadowed by the mighty labors of Paul, but after the apostolic age, he stands out again, most prominent in the memory of the church. He is chosen by the Roman Communion as its special patron saint and as the first pope. This is, Schaff saying, the alleged claim of the Roman Church. Uh, he is always named before Paul. To him, most of the churches are dedicated. Uh, he says he's, you know, crucified as a malefactor and a slave, as a poor fisherman, neither silver nor gold. Um, the triple crowned popes deposed kings, shook empires, dispensed blessings and curses on earth and in purgatory, and even now claim the power to settle infallibly all questions of Christian doctrine and discipline for the Catholic world. So Schaff is... Uh, contrasting the humble, unlearned Jewish fisherman from Galilee, that is Peter, with the ostentatiousness of the modern uh, papacy and even the papacy in the Middle Ages, especially the papacy in the Middle Ages. Um, you know, he's referring to the triple crown of, that the popes wear. Um, and he's even commentating uh, contemporaneously, as we mentioned in my review of The Pope and the Professor, on Vatican I and Pastor Eternus, uh, where uh, Pio Nono, uh, that's Pius IX, um, Pio Nono meaning a pious monk, it's a play on words, um, who is the Pope. Uh, I think he had died by the time that Schaff was writing this work, but uh, Pius IX had a very long papal reign from the 1840s all the way up through the 1870s, uh, the longest reigning Pope in history. Um, up to that time, and I think maybe even today. Um, but uh, Pio Nono, Pius IX, had declared papal infallibility, and we discussed in the video on the Pope and the Professor how Ignaz von Dollinger, who uh, 
this is all contemporaneous with Schaff, uh, opposed uh, the declaration of papal infallibility on good historical grounds. Um, but I'll refer you to that video for a deeper discussion. Schaff then talks about how Paul was the chief actor of the second stage of Christianity. He was the great apostle to the Gentiles who founded the churches of Greece and Asia Minor. He broke the yoke of the traditions of uh, the rabbis and was the herald of evangelical freedom and the standard bearer of reform and progress. Schaff comments that uh, Pauline theology was best felt in Africa uh, by Tertullian and Augustine and that the doctrines of sin and grace of the latter having no effect whatever on the Eastern Church and practically overpowered, uh, which was practically overpowered by Pelagian tendencies in the West. Um, but the 16th century would experience a revival of Pauline theology and the Christian Reformation. And uh, to that, I definitely say amen. Um, he uh, talks about uh, how... Um, Paul's name for a long time was used and abused outside of the ruling orthodoxy and hierarchy by anti-Catholic heretics and sectarians in their protest against the new yoke of traditionalism and ceremonialism. Um, but then he says how the reformers um, uh, sort of recaptured the spirit, the magisterial reformers, uh, talking about the trumpet tongues of Luther and Calvin. Um, uh, which I think is is great. Um, he uh, said, uh, you know, in regards to the Reformation uh, and how it relates to this period, uh, Schaff says, as the gospel of Christ was cast out from Jerusalem to the bless to bless the Gentiles, so Paul's epistle to the Romans was expelled from Rome to enlighten and to emancipate Protestant nations in the distant north and far west, and now I would say the global south. Um, so then Schaff talks about uh, the Apostle John, uh, who he said was the most intimate companion of Jesus, uh, who having looked back to the anti-mundane that's before the world was beginning in John 1, and forward to the post-mundane that is after this world system has ended, summation of all things, he presents and represents the inner life of the apostolic church. Um, Schaff says in regards to John, far above them all throughout the apostolic age and subsequent ages, John stands uh, the one great, or uh, he says far above them all throughout the apostolic age and sub subsequent ages stands the one great master from whom Peter, Paul, and John drew their inspiration, to whom they bowed in holy adoration, whom alone they served and glorified in life and death, to whom they still point in their writings as the perfect image of God, as the Savior from sin and death, as the giver of eternal life, as the divine harmony of the conflicting creeds and schools, as the Alpha and Omega of the Christian faith. And that is certainly true that all of the apostles, uh, whether the pillar apostles, the Twelve, um, or any of the other uh, writers of the New Testament, they are all pointing to the one singular head of our faith, um, and that is Jesus Christ himself. So then Schaff moves on uh, to section 22, which Schaff calls the critical reconstruction of the history of the apostolic age. Uh, he has a quote by uh, Goethe there uh, at the beginning. Uh, so Schaff says, um, Never before in the history of the church has the origin of Christianity with its original documents been so thoroughly examined from standpoints entirely opposite as the present generation. And he is correct. Uh, just a couple of comments here by me. Um, once again, we have to remember Schaff worked in the late 19th century, uh, which was the period in history which birthed modern critical scholarship. Uh, for better or for worse, and I would say mainly for better, uh, for uh, our understanding of apostolic Christianity is clearer today than at any other point in the history of the Christian church. Schaff states, such is the importance and the power of that little book, which, quote, contains the wisdom of the whole world, end quote, that it demands ever new investigation and sets serious minds of all shades of belief and unbelief in motion, as if their very life depended upon its acceptance or rejection. And that, I say, it's 
perfect summation of why the Bible is the most contested book in history. Um, because of the claims that it makes, uh, because of the one whom it points to and the claims that he makes, the exclusive claims of Christ have to be felt when we read the New Testament and how that works out and how we evaluate the various uh, communions and confessions that claim to be the church or part of the church. So um, Schaff says, uh, the greatest biblical scholars among the fathers were chiefly concerned in drawing from the sacred records the Catholic doctrines of salvations and the precepts for a holy life the Reformers and older Protestant divines studied them afresh with special zeal for the evangelical tenets which separated them from the Roman Church, but all stood on the common ground of a reverential belief in the divine inspiration and authority of the Scriptures. He said the present age, starting in the 19th century, and I would say this continues to today, is preeminently historical and critical. The Scriptures are subjected to the same process of investigation and analysis as any other literature production of antiquity with no other purpose than to ascertain the real facts in the case. That's key. We have to understand what actually happened. Continuing on, we want to know the precise origin, gradual growth, and final completion of Christianity as a historical phenomenon. This is what my debate opponent a year ago couldn't get through his head, is that you have to, when you, as soon as your church makes historical claims for itself, those historical claims come under scrutiny. And when you have an infallible church that claims that it does no wrong doctrinally or that it has no historical development or that, you know, uh, the historical development is only minor window dressing and doesn't have, you know, fundamental transformations in its structure. As soon as you make those claims, you better be willing to back them up, buddy. Because if you can't back up those claims, your entire system collapses. Because you are the ones claiming infallibility. You are the ones claiming divine authority on the same level of the scriptures. Your bishops and your councils and your creeds. It's like, look, I love reading church history. I love reading both secondary sources like Schaff, primary sources like Augustine and Calvin, um, you know, early church writers like Clement and Pistle to Diognetus, you know, uh, other works like that, Cyprian, Tertullian, um, whatever. But we have to recognize there's a fundamental difference between those and what God has spoken. The Protestant evangelical claim, historically speaking, confessionally speaking, I'm not talking about all of its popular instantiations that we see in America and that, unfortunately, much of which we have exported to the rest of the world, such as the Word of Faith and charismatic movements, that our historical claims are modest. We're not saying that the church has always looked the same in every age. But we are saying that the church is indefectible, that there is always the scriptures in the midst of the church, that there's always a sufficient knowledge of the gospel, even if it's admixed with error, and that there is precedent in church history for our, all of our beliefs, even if, uh, and by all of our beliefs, I mean all of our core defining beliefs in our confessional statements, that there are precedents for these beliefs in church history, things like congregationalism. Um, that was a poor choice. I mean, things like, you know, where it's not a clerical-run organization, but that the leaders of the church are raised up within the church, not that the church votes in some democratic fashion. Even though we see even in the uh, Acts 15 account of the Council of Jerusalem, um, that the brethren were there with the apostles. It was all of the men in the church, not merely the leaders or the clergy of the church themselves. Things like believer's baptism uh, definitely have um, historical warrant, uh, especially in the anti-Nicene period. Um, you know, Gavin Ortland has talked about this at length in his videos. Um, you know, multiple, multiplicity of elders as opposed to a monarchical episcopate. 
uh, all of these things, um, various understandings of the Lord's Supper, um, you know, mission societies, those sorts of things, that there's um, uh, the doctrine of sola scriptura, that there is precedent for this in church history. We're not claiming that everybody looked exactly the way that we did. The burden is on those who claim that what the modern Russian Orthodox Church, because all of these guys online have sided with the Russians over against you know Constantinople, uh, that the Russian Orthodox Church uh, is the church, uh, you know, in the Serbian and uh, the local Orthodox churches that have sided with. Uh, uh, Russia over Constantinople that they're the only true expression of Christianity. The burden of proof is on them to demonstrate that. That is the positive claim that they are making. And if they slip up in but one point, all of their exclusive claims of authority go out the window because they are the ones claiming infallibility. They are the ones claiming that their church in its councils, you know, in a proper canonical fashion, which itself is a historical development, um, is the one true church, and that all other Christians, uh, properly speaking, at least historically speaking, to them, are damned. Um, which I find absolutely ridiculous assertion that God is bound to the canonical structure of uh, the Russian Orthodox Church and its, um, you know, co its allies within the wider Eastern Orthodox Communion especially in places like Antioch and Serbia that uh, are dependent upon Russia, um, as opposed to what's going on with Constantinople. I would say the same thing with the Roman Catholic Church, and this is why Dollinger was kicked out of, um, uh, kicked out of the communion. This is why Dollinger was excommunicated, was because he could not believe in such a historical absurdity as papal infallibility. Um, Gavin Ortland in his recent uh, video on uh, the Marian dogma is discussing with Cameron Bertuzzi of Capturing Christianity, um, stated that uh, he saw the dogmatization of the bodily assumption of Mary as essential to the gospel by the Roman Pope as definitive and fatal um, to uh, Rome's particular claims. And so this is why I continue to be a Protestant, um, is because I recognize these exclusive ecclesiastical claims. They're just historically untenable, um, and I would say biblically absurd as well, that God is bound to some sort of apostolic succession in the episcopate. Um, and this is what the higher critics were pointing against and the kinds of claims that invited higher criticism and skepticism. Because they were pushing back against these very fables and misunderstandings and anachronisms in church history. And so continuing on uh, with that, um, uh, Schaff, uh, back to page 206, middle of the page, he says, um, you know, that we want to know the precise origin, gradual growth, and final completion of Christianity as a historical phenomenon in organic connection with contemporary events and currents of thought. The whole process through which it passed from the manger in Bethlehem to the cross of Calvary and from the upper room in Jerusalem to the throne of the Caesars to be reproduced, explained, and understood according to the laws of regular historical development. And in this critical process, the very foundations of the Christian faith have been assailed and undermined, so that the question is now to be or not to be. The remark of Geta is as profound as is true. The conflict of faith and unbelief remains the proper, the only, the deepest theme of the history of the world and mankind to which all others are subordinated. Schaff says, the modern critical movement began, we may say, about 1830, is still in full progress and is likely to continue to the end of the 19th century as the apostolic church itself extended over a period of 70 years before it developed its resources. So Schaff sees a lot of typology that it's poetic, but um, not always true. It says it was first confined to Germany, describing Bauer, Strauss, and the Tübingen School, then spread to France with Renan and Holland, uh, uh, Schulten and Koinen, and last to England uh, with supernatural religion in America, so that the battle now extends along the whole line of Protestantism. 
And he's right. Um, by the end of the 19th century, all the Protestant denominations were having to deal with higher criticism and with skepticism and with historical scholarship entering Rome during the time of Pius IX and then continuing on. Now Roman Catholics are having to deal with historical scholarship. And I dare say the Eastern churches are going to have to deal with it too. I made a comment to uh, my dear colleague, uh, my love, um, who is of uh, one of the Eastern churches. And I asked him after the Archbishop of the Greek Archdiocese of America was marching in a Black Lives Matter rally while many of their churches were closed during the pandemic. Do you think that your church has not been as impacted by modernism and liberalism because it has been specially preserved by God um, and will continue to be specially preserved by God? Or do you think it's because, in a lot of ways, due to cultural isolation, first under the czar and then persecution by the communists, um, that you did not have to deal historically with um, higher criticism? And, of course, he said the former, and, you know, that's in line with his convictions, and I respect that. Um, but I give a warning to all of those who um, think that they have found the alleged one true church that, uh, you know, is going to have perfect uh, preservation of tradition, and it's going to be based, and, you know, unlike, you know, those woke you know, liberal, you know, jean-wearing v-neck pastor, uh, you know, evangelical churches or the, you know, clown mass, uh, as one of their apologists says, you know, Roman Catholic Church, beware that liberalism, you know, is on your own church's doorstep and you're going to have to deal with it one way or the other and to me, I think because of the exclusive infallible claims that are made by the imperial churches, their fall into liberalism will be even harder than Protestant churches. My church, we separated ourselves from a liberal denomination. We have that option within evangelical Protestantism. We're a local autonomous Reformed Baptist church. These imperial churches where all this stuff is interconnected and you have your seminaries where they're teaching the documentary hypothesis and all this other 19th century German higher criticism that has then continued into the 20th and now 21st centuries, beware. Beware lest you fall. So uh, Schaff then goes on to discuss the two kinds of biblical criticism, one of which I think is good, the other I think has a lot of problems. And these are verbal, or what we would call lower criticism, or textual criticism, and historical, or higher criticism. So when I was doing my book review of Hansen, and he mentioned historical criticism, this is where I was like, you see, this is the watchword. Historical criticism in their context means higher criticism. So you can't sneak it past Dr. Bob. Um, so Shaw first goes on to talk about textual criticism. He says that the goal of textual criticism, or lower criticism, seeks to restore as far as possible the original text of the Greek New Testament. Uh, and in his day, they had recently discovered uh, Sinaiticus um, and Vaticanus, and I believe Alexandrinus, um, patristic quotations, anti-Nicene versions. This is before the papyri. The papyri have been an absolute boon um, to historical scholarship of uh, the Greek New Testament and are invaluable uh, to modern textual criticism. He actually discusses Westcott and Hort, um, uh, who had just published their Greek New Testament in 1881. Um, and uh, this continues even to this day. Um, Schaff refers to the Textus Receptus for all of my King James Onlyist listeners, is comparatively late and, quote, corrupt compared to what we have in the Uncial manuscripts as well as now to the papyri. And I'd say this statement by Schaff is all the more um, uh, uh, correct even today. Um, 
I love the King James Bible. I have my family's King James Bible that I inherited from my mother uh, on our shelf. Nothing against it, but in terms of the originality of the readings that we see in the King James manuscripts um, or the King James Bible, you know, it's the exact opposite of what King James only us would claim. Um, it's in fact the King James that is relatively corrupt compared to the modern text. Now you can quote, quibble with translation, but in terms of the original Greek themselves that are found in the Nestle Elan 28 um, or UBS 6 or 7, I can't remember which one they're on now, um, the critical text is much closer to the original readings um, than the, uh, the King James is. Um, Schaff, in fact, says the new text is, in fact, the older text. The reformers, in this case, are the restorers. Far from unsettling the faith in the New Testament, the results have established the substantial t integrity of the text, notwithstanding the 150,000 readings which have been gradually gathered from all sources. It is a noteworthy fact that the greatest textual critics of the 19th century are believers not indeed in a mechanical or magical inspiration, which is untenable and not worth defending, but in the divine origin and authority of the canonical writings, which rest on stronger grounds than any particular theor human theory of inspiration. This is where I say Schaff makes a good point, and he makes a dangerously bad point as well. Um, I can just see Andy Stanley or, you know, modern liberal pastors glomming onto this. No, uh, I would push back against Schaff at this point and say it's the plenary that is full, verbal, and that's word for word, inspiration of the New Testament, um, that that is the doctrine of inspiration that we should defend. Scriptural inerrancy. Um, and what I see with what modern criticism has essentially discovered is that we have a 10,000-piece puzzle, but we have 10,100 pieces. Uh, I believe James White has used that quote before. Um, so we have a lot to put together in terms of the original text of the New Testament, but we actually know what the original meanings are. And even somebody like Bart Ehrman can only point to two places where he thinks the original reading may have been lost. And I think that's disputable. So, um, that's a very different case than what the Muslims have to deal with, since they don't know and can't be reliable, or are certain uh, that their readings are reliable, because Uthman gathered up all of the uh, variant readings of the Quran and burned them and produced a state-sanctioned version of the Quran. And uh, the discovery of the Sa'ana Palimpsest manuscript um, uh, demonstrates this, and I think is a big problem for uh, modern Sunni orthodoxy in terms of their understanding of inspiration and the uh, preservation of the Quran. I think the New Testament, um, uh, we don't have that problem because we didn't have a state transmission of the text um, until much, much later in history, and even then there was not one origin or one source of transmission. So anyways, that's lower criticism. Now we come to oh, historical criticism, as Schaff says in the German, Hoher Kritik. This is higher criticism. And uh, he says, this has assumed two very distinct shapes under the lead of, on the one hand, Dr. Augustus Neander in Berlin, and on the other hand, Dr. Ferdinand Bauer in Tübingen who labored in the minds of church history at a respectful distance from each other and never came into personal context. He says, historical criticism deals with the origin, spirit, and aim of the New Testament writings, their historical environments and organic place in the great intellectual and religious process, which resulted in the triumph and establishment of the Catholic Church in the second century. He says, Neander and Bauer were giants, equal in genius and learning, honesty and earnestness, but widely different in spirit. Um, he talks about how uh, Neander was orthodox and was zealous uh, for the faith, whereas Bauer was a skeptic um, and uh, provided um, 
much of the impulse for unbelieving uh, scholarship as it exists today. He talks about Neander's uh, works, uh, his first edition of the Apostolic Age in 1832, and then... Um, a Neander's Life of Jesus against Strauss in 1837 and then general church history begun in 1825 but revised in 1842. So Neander's the Orthodox conservative believing historical critic whereas Bauer is the unbelieving critic. He discusses Bauer's works, um, the Corinthian Parties in 1831, Paul in 1845, Church History of the First Three Centuries in 1853, revised in 1860, and then his pupil Strauss preceded him with his first Leben Jesu in 1835, which created a greater sensation than any of the works mentioned, surpassed only by that of Renan's uh, V.A. de Jesus, which is the life of Jesus nearly 30 years later in 1863, which, as we mentioned before, landed Renan upon the Index uh, Prohibitorum, Index Librorum Prohibitorum, the Index of Prohibited Books. So, um, while Strauss and Bauer popularized higher criticism in the German-speaking uh, world, uh, it was Renan who popularized higher criticism in the uh, French-speaking world. Um, and then from there, uh, from both streams, it jumps over to English. He then discusses, uh, once again, uh, our great uh, friend uh, J.B. Lightfoot, uh, who he said, in contrast to Bauer, Renan, and Strauss, Lightfoot became the champion of conservative criticism and was influenced by Neander. While Lightfoot was impressed with German scholarship's ability to ascertain historical facts, he faulted its ability to draw the right conclusions, and Lightfoot said that reverential faith is needed to draw the correct conclusions. Um, he says, um, while the Germans were great at delineating facts, he denies to the Germans quickness and delicacy of perception he says, sometime or something more is needed uh, than learning and perception to draw conclusions from the right fact. He said, sound common sense and well-balanced judgment. And when we deal with the sacred and supernatural facts, we need first and last reverential spirit and that faith which is the organ of the supernatural. It is here where the two schools depart without difference of nationality. For faith is not a national but individual gift. Amen. Schaff then uh, goes on to describe the two antagonistic schools. Um, he said Neander and Bauer were antagonistic in principle and aim, Neander being conservative and reconstructive, Bauer being radical and destructive. He says the former accepts the canonical gospels and acts as honest, truthful, and credible memoirs, credible memoirs of the life of Jesus. And he says... The latter rejects a great part of their context, contents as unhistorical myths or legends of the post-apostolic age, and on the other hand, gives undue credit to wild heretical romances of the second century. This is like Da Vinci Code stuff, where Dan Brown will talk about the Gnostics, or, you know, uh, you know Bart Ehrman, uh, well, less so Bart Ehrman. I feel he's actually a little bit more balanced. He's in my area. I'd like to meet Bach. Uh, Dr. Ehrman at some point. Um, but, uh, yeah, so anyways, um, Neander is conservative and believing. Schaff is unconservative and not believing. And so both bring their presuppositions to the table. Schaff uh, says that uh, Bauer was a naturalist. He said... Um, uh, in regards to miracles, uh, he uh, proceeded from disbelief in the supernatural and miraculous as a philosophical impossibility and tries to explain the gospel history and the apostolic history from purely natural causes like every other history. Where he says uh, Neander had a moral and spiritual as well as intellectual interest in the New Testament. Uh, Bauer was purely intellectual and critical. 
He says, Neander approaches the historical investigation with the subjective experience of the divine truth in the heart and conscience and knows and feels Christianity to be a power of salvation from sin and error. Whereas Bauer's view um, views Christianity as simply the best above many religions, which are destined to give way at last to the sovereignty of reason and philosophy, i.e. secular humanism. My good friend Joseph Cotto, uh, you are definitely in the uh, the Bauer school of viewing the Bible, whereas I am definitely in the Neander school of viewing the Bible, um, my good friend, but we will discuss that more at a later time. Um, Schaff says, to sort of sum up the antagonism in the two schools of higher criticism, obviously the skeptical one has prevailed to this day, but... There are believing critics as well. Um, he says, The controversy turns on the question whether there is a God in history or not. As the contemporaneous struggle in natural science turns on the question whether there is a God in nature or not. Belief in a personal God, almighty and omnipresent in history and nature, implies the possibility of supernatural and miraculous revelation. Absolute freedom from prepossession such as Strauss demanded, is absolutely impossible. Quote, ex nihilo nihil fit, end quote. There is prepossession on either side of the controversy, the one positive, the other negative, and history itself must decide between them. The facts must rule philosophy, not philosophy, the facts. And this is where the higher critics go off the rails. They assume a certain form of church history based off of faulty presuppositions, and then they try to say, well, this work is um, uh, legitimate or uh, real versus this one being a forgery based off of their own presuppositions. They don't let the text speak for themselves. Um, so it's, in fact, the skeptics who are not allowing the facts uh, of the matter to... Uh, be put into the court of law. Schaff then continues, if it can be made out that the life of Christ and the apostolic church can be psychologically and historically explained only by the admission of the supernatural element which they claim, while every other explanation only increases the difficulty of the problem and substitutes an unnatural miracle for a supernatural one, the historian has gained the case and it is for the philosopher to adjust his theory to history. The duty of the historian is not to make the facts, but to discover them, and then to construct his theory wide enough to give them all comfortable room. And I say that is a, a good, uh, good perspective to have. Quickly moving on as we uh, approach uh, the latter portion of this stream today. He talks about the two antagonistic schools, um, or the alleged antagonism in the apostolic church. The primary theory that undergirded higher criticism in the Tübingen school starts from the assumption of a fundamental antagonism between Jewish or primitive Christianity represented by Peter and Gentile or progressive Christianity represented by Paul and resolves all the writings of the New Testament into tendency writing which give us not history pure and simple, but adjust it to a doctrinal and practical aim in the interest of the one party or a compromise between the two. That's the fundamental presupposition. They're not interested in the bare facts. They've come up with this theory, and now they're trying to adjust all of the facts to that theory. If you understand that, that'll help demythologize all of higher critical liberal scholarship. Um, is that they're not actually starting from the facts of the matter. They're starting from a presupposition, a naturalistic, antagonistic presupposition, and then adjusting all the facts from there. Schaff says, um, uh, in regards to uh, the other figures, he says, John is also seen as representing Jewish Christianity, especially in Revelation, um, Bauer asserts that John excludes Paul from the list of the apostles in Revelation 21.14, calls him, quote, a false Jew, quote, in Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, a, quote, false apostle in Revelation 2.2, a, quote, false prophet 
in Revelation 2.20 and as Balaam in Revelation 2.2, 2, 6, 4, and 15 compared to Jude 11 and 2 Peter 15. Um, which I think is, uh, as Schaff says, just, you know, absolutely um, remarkable uh, or irremarkable uh, um, and uh, sort of... Uh, uh, just bewildering that uh, Bauer and the Tubingen theologians uh, would leap to that conclusion given the internal uh, text that we have, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And I think it's good that Schaff titles this uh, section The Alleged Antagonism in the Apostolic Church because we're going to see there isn't such an antagonism. He said, uh, beyond uh, this alleged antagonism, Bauer, Renan, and other higher critics said that all of Paul's letters besides Galatians, Roman, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians are post-apostolic forgeries, not written by Paul himself. This is an even more radical view than people who accept, um, I believe it's 1st uh, and 2nd Thessalonians and one of the prison epistles uh, today, maybe it's Philippians, Ephesians, I can't remember, or Colossians. Um, uh, so even someone like Bart Ehrman accepts seven of the Pauline epistles as genuine. So this shows how higher criticism has even moderated itself as time has gone along. Um, Schaff uh, said that the higher critics uh, dated John uh, at a late period, um, some as late as 170 AD, um, which is interesting that um, now that we have discovered P52, which is the earliest writing that we have in the New Testament, um, which is dated to approximately 158, 125 AD, which predates all of the late dates that the uh, higher critics gave to the Gospel of John, um, I find it quite ironic and humorous and uh, fortuitous. Um, so the higher critics have actually been proven factually wrong on the dating of John. And even more ironically, the fragment of John on P52 that we have is from John 18, 31 through 33 on one side, then 37 and 38 on the other side, which is Pilate's ironic question to Jesus asking him, what is truth? And so I can say the same uh, uh, accusation can be uh, turned around uh, at the skeptic and say, well, what is truth if you're not willing to let the record speak for itself? So in the minds of the higher critics, the sober, historical, reliable accounts of the Gospels, Acts, and the Epistles are mere literary fictions, intellectual exercises, and delusions. Um, Schaff saw in modern higher criticism a renewal of the second century heretical schools who attack scriptures such as the Ebionites and Martian, which we will get into when we uh, get into a discussion of the second century. However, just as the old Gnosticism had a refining effect on the true Christianity, the modern Gnosticism of higher criticism has done inadvertent service to the church by, quote, removing old prejudices. Notice what I said earlier about the imperial churches. Opening new avenues of thought, shedding lights on the first century, stimulating research and compelling a historical scientific reconstruction of the origins of Christianity in the church. It will only ultimately strengthen our faith and work to God's own glory. Schaff then discusses the reaction to higher criticism. He said, in the end, even Bauer acknowledged Paul's conversion as an inexplicable miracle. Many higher critics, critics uh, had actually moderated their views in later writings in Schaff's day, um, so such as you know, a good example or a modern corollary, think of how moderate Bart Ehrman is, even though I think he's still quite liberal, um, compared to many of the internet atheist trolls that you find uh, out there among your garden variety atheists. Uh, I remember listening to a program once where, you know, this black atheist was interviewing Bart Ehrman and he was thinking Dr. Ehrman was going to come on there and say, oh, Jesus never existed and, you know, promote Robert Price's Jesus mythicism and all this kind of stuff. And then Bart Ehrman's like, nope, Jesus was a real person. Paul is a real person. We have authentic writings in the New Testament. You know, I disagree with these over here, but, you know, he was 
a rabbi from Galilee who was crucified by the Romans under Pontius Pilate, and this all definitely happened historically. You know, he disbelieves the resurrection, um, which is why Bart Ehrman's not a Christian um, and would still be considered an apostate because he wants claim to believe this. But it was funny just seeing the atheist guy after Bart Ehrman, you know, left the podcast um, after he'd finished interviewing him be like, well, that was interesting because he didn't give him the kind of fodder that he thought Dr. Ehrman was going to give him. Um, so it's interesting that Schaff even noticed this trend in his own day, um, that many of the higher critics had moderated some of their views, admitting that there were genuine writings in the New Testament and that there was reliable history and um, we actually could know some things about the first century. Um, he said the Acts of the Apostles in particular um, has over time come to be seen as generally historically reliable, even by the most skeptical of scholarship, and I would actually say of all the works of history, in particular in ancient history, none is better than the Acts of the Apostles. I believe the Acts of the Apostles, in terms of its granular, in terms of its granular description of history in the middle of the first century in the Eastern Roman Empire, um, it's, it's astounding how accurate. Um, the writer of Acts is, um, who I believe to be good Dr. Luke, and um, I believe directly points to the divine origins of the Acts of the Apostles. Schaff discusses the positive school by saying, while there are signs of disintegration in the ranks of destructive criticism, the historic truth and genuineness of the New Testament writings have found learned and able defenders from different standpoints, such as Neander, Ullman, C.F. Schmid, a colleague of Bauer, and Tubingen, and then he goes on and quotes other guys uh, as well. He says, The English and American mind has also fairly begun to grapple manfully and successfully with these questions in scholars such as Lightfoot, Westcott, uh, Ezra Abbott, uh, as well as others. Um, he says, English and American theology is not likely to be extensively demoralized by these hypercritical speculations of the continent. And I would say, oh, if only this had lasted. Um, we did last for a while in the Anglophone world, um, much, much longer than Germany or France or the continental scholars did. But alas, um, even Anglo-American um, theology eventually fell um, and great has been its fall but even still in this day we have a remnant preserved and there are more people in the Anglo phone world um, who are of a believing conservative perspective than there are in say Germany or the Netherlands or Switzerland or Austria or France um, in spite of our problems, it's not nearly as bad as it is in continental Europe where atheism just seems to have ruled the day. Um, Schaff continues the finishing of that paragraph. It has a firmer foothold in an active church life. This is key. It felt like in Germany and um, the continent of Europe by the 19th century, church was something you went to. It was not part of the active local community. The idea of the village church where everybody gathered and to me this is a function of the imperial church's structure as well as many of the magisterial reform churches and the lutheran church um, where you go to see the spectacle of the mass of the eucharist as opposed to hear the preaching of the word um, and uh, where you have these great cavernous cathedrals as opposed to the country church you know with uh, the religious freedom that we had with the baptists uh, and Methodists going out into the countryside and preaching and uh, the predominance of low church Protestantism here in the United States, um, uh, you had a much more active church life um, than you did on the continent. That's totally true. And uh, the convictions and the affections of the people, uh, the common populace in England and America at that time were much more believing than in Germany or on the continent says, the German and French mind, like the Athenian, is always bent upon telling and hearing something new, while the Anglo-American mind cares 
more for what is true, whether it be old or new, and the truth must ultimately prevail. Amen. So then Schaff continues on uh, in this next section called St. Paul's Testimony to Historical Christianity. And this is our penultimate section, so bear with me, guys. We're going to be wrapping up here shortly. Um, he says, um, Even the most radical of the higher critics accept Galatians, Romans, and First and Second Corinthians as genuine, written between the years 54 and 58, um, because the other apostles were still alive at the time, and this was written within, they were written within 25 years of the crucifixion. And he says, um, even if we were to exclude the other writings of the New Testament, um, that those four epistles alone, and I'll leave it to you guys to read this section um, or to go get it on um, ccel.org where you can read it in the PDF form, um, that uh, even with just these four epistles alone, we can prove pretty much all of the basic facts of the early church um, in Paul's day and all of the basic doctrines of the Christian faith. Um, Schaff states that Paul is a contemporary of Christ uh, who is an intimate uh, follower of the Sanhedrin and those who had murdered Christ. He was initially hostile to Christianity um, for reasons that were quite understandable, being a zealous Jew. And of his conversion, Schaff says, and this is what I agree with, we don't pay enough attention to this in um, our churches, um, that Paul's conversion, we've mentioned this before, the miraculous nature of him seeing the risen Jesus is one of the clearest evidences of Christianity and a satisfactory answer to the chief objections of modern skepticism. He says, the four unopposed Pauline epistles prove the following things. The leading facts of the life of Christ, number one, including the divine mission, birth from a woman, Davidic descent, resurrection on the third day, repeated manifestations to his disciples, holy life, betrayal, death, ascension, and exaltation to God's right hand, messiahship, lordship, eternal salvation, institution of baptism, the Lord's Supper, the mission of the Holy Spirit, and the founding of the church by the Twelve Apostles are all proved in just these four epistles. Number two, Paul's unconversion and apostleship, specifically in the epistle to the Galatians. Number three, the origin and rapid progress of the Christian church in all parts of the Roman Empire, that is Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, Asia Minor, and Achaia, and Macedonia and Greece. Number four, the presence of miracles in the church, even though Paul emphasizes more so, even than external miracles, the inner life of the disciples. Number five, the existence of controversy. Not the facts of the gospel of Jesus itself, but the meaning, interpretation, and uh, application of said facts. And we see that no clearer than in Galatians with the Judaizers. Number six, the essential doctrinal, and this is key over against the uh, higher critics, the essential doctrinal unity of Paul and the elder apostles, Galatians 2, uh, 1 through 10 being the main passage where Peter, James, and John affirm Paul's gospel. Um, he says um, uh, the statement by Paul uh, that uh, he considered the elder apostles men in high repute while he considered himself in sincere humility the least of the apostles because he represented the persecuted church of God. Schaff says, This statement by Paul makes it simply impossible and absurd to suppose with Bowers, Weigler, Zeller, and Renan that John should have so contradicted and stultified himself as to attack in the apocalypse the same Paul whom he had recognized as a brother during his life, as a false apostle and chief of the synagogue of Satan after his death. Such a reckless and monstrous assertion turns either Paul or John into a liar. The antinomian and anti-Christian heretics of the apocalypse who plunged into all sorts of moral and ceremonial pollutions would have been condemned by Paul as much as by John. Yea, he himself, in his parting address to the Ephesian elders, 
had prophetically foreannounced and described such teachers as, quote, grievous wolves, end quote, that would after his departure enter in among them or rise from the midst of them, not sparing the flock, Acts chapter 20, verse 29 through 30. On the question of fornication, he was entire was in entire harmony with the teaching of the apocalypse, and as to the question of eating meat sacrificed to idols, though he regarded it a thing indifferent in itself, considering the vanity of idols, yet he condemned it whenever it gave offense to weak consciences of the more scrupulous Jewish converts. And this was in accord with the decree of the Apostolic Council. Acts chapter 15, 29. Number seven, Paul's collision with Peter at Antioch. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. This pillar of the Tubingen theory actually proves the very opposite of what they are trying to say. For it was not a difference in principle and doctrine. On the contrary, Paul expressly asserts that Peter at first, freely and habitually, and Schaff gets into grammar here, talking about the imperfect tense of sunexian, uh, sunexian, uh, Galatians 2.12, uh, the imperfect tense with that verb is used, associated with the Gentile converts as brethren in Christ, but was intimidated by emissaries from the bigoted Jewish converts in Jerusalem and acted against his better conviction when he had entertained ever since the vision at Joppa and which he had so boldly confessed at the Council of Jerusalem and carried out in Antioch. We here have the same impulsive, impressible, changeable disciple, the first to confess and the first to deny his master, yet quickly returning to him in bitter repentance and sincere humility. It is for this inconsistency of conduct, which Paul called by the strong term of dissimulation or hypocrisy, that he and his uncompromising zeal for the great principle of Christian liberty reproved Peter publicly before the church. A public wrong had to be publicly rectified. There's a lot that could be said about that. According to the Tübingen hypothesis, the hypocrisy would have been in the very opposite conduct of Peter. The silent submission of Peter on the occasion approves his, dis proves his regard for his younger colleague and speaks as much to his praise as his weakness to his blame. That the alienation was only temporary and did not break up their fraternal relation is apparent from the respectful though frank manner which several years after the occurrence they allude to each other as fellow apostles. Compare Galatians 1.18, 19, 2.8, and 9, 1 Corinthians 9.5, 2 Peter 3.15-16, and from the fact that Mark and Silas were connecting links between them and alternatively served them both. And it's very interesting because then he goes on to talk about um, that uh, just like the Marcionites and Ebionites alternatively appealed to Paul and Peter respectively in their day, it's no more surprising that rationalists and atheists report to Luther and Calvin in our day as justification for their unbelief. It's interesting, though. Paul has an interesting footnote on Renan's commentary on the alleged antagonism of Jew Gentile and Jewish Christianity rec um, recognized in Peter and Paul's alleged antagonism in Galatians. <laughs> Schaff is actually kind of punking Renan here. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really kind of a funny quote. I'll read it to you. It's at the bottom of 216. It says, It is assuming a... He says, It is amusing to read Renan's account of this dispute in his work, St. Paul, chapter 10. He sympathizes rather with Peter, whom he calls a man, quote, profoundly kind and upright and desiring peace above all things, quote, though he admits him to have been an amiably weak and inconsistent on that as on other occasions, while he charges Paul with stubbornness and rudeness. But what is most important? Uh, but what is the most important point? He denies the Tubingen exegesis when he says, "Modern critics who infer from certain passages of the Epistle to the Galatians the rupture between Peter and Paul was absolute, put themselves in contradiction not only to the Acts but also to other passages of the Epistle to the Galatians, verses one eighteen and two two. Fervent men pass their lives disputing together without ever falling out." We must not judge these characters after the manner of things which take place in our day between people well-bred and susceptible in a point of honor. 
This last word especially never had much significance with the Jews. And I think the main point that Schaff is communicating here, even from skeptical Renan, is that Renan is recognizing his own Victorian-era 19th century historical biases. They were reading back into history, like, social mores and constructions of the 19th century that, well, there had to have been this antagonism because of this. And it's interesting to think that so much of modern liberal scholarship could have arisen potentially from a misunderstanding of social mores that caused Bauer and the other Tübingen theologians to have an incorrect exegesis of uh, Galatians chapter 2 because they were um, reading back through their own cultural lenses upon the first century. And so we always have to recognize um, our own biases, but I thought that was very interesting um, that Renan himself um, pushed back. Um, so it's interesting, though, uh, continuing on, and we'll finish up this subsection before we get to the last uh, section in the chapter. Schaff says, It is not to be supposed that all sub obscure points have already been satisfactorily cleared up or will ever be solved beyond the possibility of dispute. There must be some room left for faith in that God who has revealed himself clearly enough in nature and in history to strengthen our faith and who is concerned enough to try our faith. Certain interstellar spaces will always be vacant in the firmament of the apostolic age that men may gaze all the more intensely at the bright stars before which the post-apostolic books disappear like torches. A careful study of the ecclesiastical writers of the 2nd and 3rd centuries, and especially of the numerous apocryphal acts, epistles, and apocalypses, leaves on the, strong, on the mind a strong impression of the immeasurable superiority of the New Testament in purity and truthfulness, simplicity and majesty. And this superiority points to a special agency of the Spirit of God, without which that book of books is an inexplicable mystery. This is the heart of Sola Scriptura that Schaff is getting to. It's the character, it's the nature of Scripture that makes it superior to any form of alleged oral or written apostolic tradition. The only testimony firsthand that we have of the life of Jesus is from the canonical 27 books of the New Testament. And that is why they were received and recognized as such by the church. Not because the church declared with authority that the church had the right to define scripture, but because the church, which had already been defined by scripture, recognized its origin and source, which is the New Testament. God gave us a book before he gave us a church. This is directly in contradiction to the claims of the imperial church. The 27 books of the New Testament are built upon the foundation of the law and the prophets. The Old Testament was already in existence by the time the church was founded. And Christ held his church to that book. Just because we have added new writings to that book does not mean that the book did not precede the church. God gave to his people a book that defined his people before he gave a church. And so with that, I'll continue on uh, to our last section, uh, section 23, Chronology of the Apostolic Age. He says, The chronology of the Apostolic Age is partly conjectural, uh, partly certain. Um, certain as to the principal events from AD 30 to 70, conjectural as to the intervening points in the last 30 years of the first century. He says, The sources are the New Testament, especially the Acts and the Pauline Epistles, Josephus and the Roman Historians. Says Josephus is especially valuable here as he wrote the Jewish history down to the destruction of Jerusalem. And Schaff says the following dates are more or less certain and accepted by most historians. And there's a little bit of wiggle room here as time has gone along, but Schaff even 
130 years ago, 140 years ago, is basically right. Number one, the founding of the Christian church in May of AD 30, the Feast of Pentecost. This assumes that Christ was born in 4 or 5 BC and was crucified at the age of 33. Number two, the death of Herod Agrippa I in AD 44. This settles the preceding martyrdom of James the Elder and Peter's imprisonment and release. And much of this comes from uh, Josephus, uh, comparing that with uh, the description in Acts. Number three, the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem in AD 50. Uh, it's about, some people say maybe AD 48 today, um, but roughly around AD 50, um, which we see in Acts 15.1 and Galatians 2, 1 through 10. Reckoning backwards from Paul's conversion, which we say is about 37 AD, maybe a little earlier today, and forward to his Caesarean imprisonment, 14 years elapsed, which we get in his um, epistles. Number four, the dates of the epistles to the Galatians, Corinthians, and Romans between 54 and 58, or 56 and 58. He said the date of the epistle to the Romans, this is very interesting, can be almost fixed to the month from its indications combined with the statements of the Acts. It was written before the apostle had been in Rome, but when he was on point of departure for Jerusalem and Rome on the way to Spain, after having finished his collections in Macedonia and Achaia for the brethren in Judea, uh, poor brethren in Judea, and he sent epistles through Phoebe, a deaconess of the congregation in the eastern port of Corinth. A deaconess of the congregation in the eastern port of Corinth, where he was at the time. These indications clearly point to the spring of the year 58, in that year, he was taken prisoner in Jerusalem and carried to Caesarea. Number five, Paul's captivity in Caesarea from AD 58 through 60. This was under the proc procuratorship of Antonius Felix and Portius Festus. And I'll make a brief comment on Roman history here for those who say we don't read history on the Dr. Bob channel. That... Uh, this is fascinating, the whole idea of uh, what the various Roman offices and governors were called. It seems sort of arcane um, or obscure in this day and age, um, but it's actually quite relevant to the veracity of the New Testament. Uh, modern scholarship um, actually corrects some of Schaff's uh, uh, terminology that he uses in the appendix of this chapter. Um, Pontius Pilate was actually a military prefect. And we get this from the Pilate Stone, which has been discovered um, since when Schaff wrote in our day-to-day. -day. And so we actually see that from the time of Jesus' execution under Pontius Pilate, who's a military man, which makes sense because he's commanding the troops, uh, he's up there in the uh, Praetorium, um, he was um, a military governor, a prefectus, um, ruling over Judea that before the Judean Roman War and after Pilate, there had been a change in the structure of the imperial province of Judea, which even this demands a discussion. You had imperial provinces, which the emperor himself was uh, responsible for, primarily on the frontiers, versus the senatorial provinces in the interior of the empire, such as Italy and certain parts of North Africa, like Carthage, Greece, uh, these were in the purview of the Senate, and this is during the period of the Roman Empire known as the Principate, in which the emperor styled himself not as a king, but as first citizen among all the various Roman citizens. And so Pilate was a military prefect in Judea, but Felix and Festus were procurators, not prefects, which means they were more civilian governors. There had been a division... Um, and this is probably due to assassination uh, attempts on Tiberius, as well as the assassination of Caligula and uh, Emperor Claudius and Nero as well. Um, there had been developments in the Julio-Claudian dynasty and their ruling philosophy um, to uh, divide power um, between military governors and civilian governors. That way, uh, a provincial governor could not get too much power. This is something that we see uh, come to a four um, in the year of the four emperors and then later in the year of the five emperors at the end of the, the uh, second century where 
governors over large and powerful provinces um, who commanded multiple legions could potentially be a rival to the imperial throne for the emperor himself. And so you're starting to see a division of labor out in the provinces, and this um, is really codified under Diocletian and Constantine at the end of the 3rd and beginning of the 4th century after the crisis period, um, which we'll get to later. But uh, this, uh, the, the reason I say this, these are actually a, uh, Felix and Festus, or Antonius Felix and Portius Festus, uh, their first names are given, their praenomens are given uh, in Josephus and in Tacitus. So they actually confirm uh, what Luke has written down in Acts, um, both in terms of the men's names, when they were there as the procurators of Judea, um, as well as their personal character um, are backed up. So it's a fascinating study, um, but I thought that would be edifying to you guys. Uh, moving on, number six uh, for uh, firm dates or relatively firm dates. Paul's first captivity in Rome from AD 61 to AD 63. Um, this is in connection with Acts 28.30 and uh, the prior history. Number seven, the prison epistles were written during that time. So Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon um, were written from AD 61 to 63. The Neronian persecution in AD 64, the tenth year of, year of Nero, according to Tacitus. Uh, the martyrdom of Peter and Paul uh, occurred either then or according to tradition a few years later. The question depends on a possible sec second Roman captivity of Paul, which I believe in myself. I think there was a second captivity of Paul, clearly when you're reading in the pastoral epistles, which I view as genuine history in contrast to skeptics um, that the pastoral epistles Paul is suffering under worse conditions than he is at the end of Acts this seems to point to a different kind of imprisonment that we see especially in 2nd Timothy um, versus what we see at the end of Acts um, so I do agree with uh, Schaff's statement there and then 9 and 10 are the destruction of Jerusalem by uh, Titus, that's the son of Vespasian in AD 70, who would later himself become emperor, who saw the completion of the Colosseum, by the way. Um, and then in 10, uh, the death of John after the accession of Trajan in 98, which is according to general ecclesiastical tradition. Schaff then talks about uh, the dating of the Synoptic Gospels, Acts, the Pastoral Epistles, Hebrews, and Catholic Epistles before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, especially the Epistle to the Hebrews, I think gives clear indication it's written before the destruction of the Temple based upon the apologetic uh, argument that uh, Hebrews makes against the Jewish priesthood, which was still operative in that day. Um, and then finally, Schaff puts John's writings towards the close of the first century, but accepts the earlier date for Revelation over the later date. Um, so he accepts the roughly 68 to 69 AD um, dating for Revelation as opposed to 96 AD um, under the reign of Domitian. Um, I tend to favor the latter date. Um, I think it's like a quote either in Irenaeus or Justin, one of the two who mentioned, it's one of the second century writers who mentioned that this book went out during the reign of Domitian, um, which ended in 96 AD. Um, it's hard to say. I won't wade into that too much for now. But that closes off uh, chapter three of History of the Christian Church, volume one. Um, chapter four will be uh, the next one, um, which is on Jewish Christianity. Um, it's a longer section, but I hope that we can hit more of the high points as opposed to being quite as granular. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll be before the next seven or eight months when I get back to you guys. Um, like I said, I'm going to be reading in the Institutes as well, and hopefully we'll have a series in there. And I may even start up a series discussing medical ethics and some of the history of medicine too. As a board certified physician, um, but uh, thank you guys so much for your attention. Uh, as always, like, comment, and subscribe. Um, it's just such a blessing to be able to do this. Um, 
open to talking with anybody uh, in person. Um, and, uh, you know, check my email and uh, the link uh, on my about page. And uh, yeah, uh, grace and peace uh, be with you all. And um, happy Sabbath. And uh, hope you all have a good, happy Lord's Day tomorrow. Uh, God bless.